Welcome to the Kaleidoscope Podcast. It's your host, George Salas. Early in 2022, I had the pleasure of speaking with the one and only Alan Singer. For those who don't know, Alan is the author of six novels, including The Charnel Imp, The Inquisitor's Tongue, and most recently, Play, a novel, published by Gran Iota in 2020. He also writes about aesthetics and the visual arts. His most recent work in this area is Posing Sex Toward a Perceptual Ethics for Literary and Visual Art, published by Bloomsbury in 2018. What I love about Alan's work is his commitment to the sentence of prose that minds rather than spoon-feeds. There is a violent tension in his novels that is both alluring and appalling as it invites, no, forces the reader to reflect on themselves and what we are all potentially capable of. He employs what could be deemed dream imagery, not in an escapist fashion, rather as a way to heighten the real. Anyway, to learn more about his work, I encourage you to seek out the two reviews I wrote, which can be found on thekaleidoscope.com. In this episode, we talk about whether or not an MFA is useful, the increasingly stifling atmosphere of universities, the question of free will versus acting, the primitive muses of violence and sex, film adaptions, dealing with doubt as a writer, as well as Alan's fruitful friendship with Joseph McElroy, but his unfortunately failed attempt to befriend Juna Barnes, and much more. So, without further ado, let's get to the conversation. Hey, Alan, how are you doing? Good, how are you, George? I'm pretty good, thank you. Uh, Thanks so much for being on the show. My pleasure, really. I wanted to ask you about the young writer Alan Singer, who wrote The Oxbreath. But actually, I want to go back a little bit further and ask you about uh, some more biographical information, if you're willing to indulge me a bit, about where you were born sure, and things of that nature. Yeah, I was born, uh, unceremoniously enough, in Atlantic City. I didn't live there long. My, mm. my father worked uh, at a radio station there on the uh, Steel Pier. And what, what capacity did he work for the radio station? He was just a sound engineer. Did anything uh, like the stories uh, or the songs influence you at that time from the radio? Uh, well, no, I was only six months old. Or <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> so we left and they went to New York after that. And then mm. uh, my father finally worked for Voice of America in D.C. And so I really grew up in Northern Virginia just outside D.C. And so how long do we have to fast forward until we get to the ambitious Alan Singer who wrote <laughs> The Ox Breath? <laughs> well, that was written in, in graduate school, um, mm. where I was... Um, I had never really intended to go to... I mean, I had written short fictions before mm. that. Um, I worked for a, a documentary film company in D.C. And... Um, I'd, I'd written short fictions, and, and I was writing longer fictions, and I decided to go to the University of Washington uh, out of a probably misbegotten romanticism about Malcolm Lowry and, uh-huh. and uh, Theodore Retke, who were famous writers who lived in the Northwest and whose work I admired, and I got an MFA there. So were those your two guiding stars, as it were? No, not really. No. <laughs> that that all changed. I suppose the the strongest influence was uh, Gina Barnes and Nightwood, which I read early on in in uh, in the program, and um, struck me as a kind of mirror image of my ambitions as a writer. So, yeah, Nightwood, that's one I've been meaning to read for quite a while. Uh, a lot of people compare it to 
Joyce's work. I know she she actually met Joyce and right. was to some degree a friend. Both Joyce, what, Joyce and Elliot. Oh, yes. So I noticed that the Ox Breath was published by a publishing collective. I think it was titled New Earth Books. Yes. Can you tell me a bit about that publishing collective? Um, it was new, and uh, the, I had been taking a, a, a tutorial with Clarence Major, and he knew the editor and sent my manuscript there, and they decided to do it. Mm -hmm. But it was their first venture, and it was a fairly serious botch <laughs> all the way around. Uh, they they uh, printed the uncopy edited version of the manuscript, so I wasn't particularly happy with it. But I was still in graduate school, so and I was happy to get something published, something long published. And what other books did they publish at that time? Any any gems that we need to know about? Not no, I don't think so. <laughs> hmm. uh, I think they published four books after mine and went out of business. It, it was a, um, a short-lived venture, I think. Well, to go back a little bit, you got your MFA, and that was a, a bit before uh, the MFA became something of an industry, would you say? Yes. It was very informal operation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, in fact, I didn't even take any workshops. I did it all by tutorial. Hmm. Um, I mean, I tried to take a workshop with the uh, poet and fiction writer David Wagner, but he was awful. <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, the protocol for the for the workshop was you came in and he would read your piece, um, and that would be the the sum of it. And um, so I walked out and I just made ad hoc arrangements with other tutors. Hmm. Are there any valuable lessons you learned at that time, or was it just an environment f for you to work on your craft? Well, I, I was working sort of in parallel with um, an MA in English and, a PhD, and then a PhD, which I really never had an ambition to do. Hmm. But the, um, it was at that moment when f French theory was coming it was infiltrating in English departments and uh, some very terrific uh, faculty came on board, uh, Charles Altieri and Leroy Searle, and uh, became suddenly this exciting place intellectually. And I was, so I was writing my fiction and then working on um, what ultimately became a dissertation and then a book about metaphor. What's the gist, if you can indulge me on that? Uh, the gist mm -hmm. is probably that uh, it's, <laughs> it'd be, it's not just the gist, it's, it's the enduring theme, I think, of my mm -hmm. work, uh, that metaphor is a, is a mode of action uh, uh, in thought uh, mm -hmm. and uh, is inescapable and indispensable. It almost seems like there's an emphasis there on the subconscious, would you say, or no? Um, no, I think this, for me, the, self, the, the idea of the subconscious mystifies things too much. I'm mm. sort of committed to, oddly enough, you know, the world in all of its, you know, perceptual, lively perceptual immediacy. And, uh, and so I... I sort of resist the idea of uh, that something's getting expressed out of a reservoir of, of experience that's in lieu of experience, I guess. Not to focus too much on the MFA, but I am curious about it since how long did you uh, teach the MFA program at your university? Oh, at Temple. Uh, Temple. Yeah, uh, my, well, the whole time. Uh, well, not actually the whole time. We started the program Five years after I was hired, mm -hmm. Toby Olson, the novelist and poet, started the program. And so I must have taught for at least 25 years. 
it seems, I don't know about the past, but these days writers think that if they want to be taken seriously, they have to get an, an MFA. Yeah. Uh, it, you think that's the case? No. Um, absolutely not. I mean, I think my experience was I wrote, you know, I, and I, I uh, listened to my readers. Um, I don't think the MA, MFA is essential to, to writing. The one mm. advantage of it uh, is that uh, you're exposing yourself to other minds, basically. You're, mm. um, you're expressing yourself, but the expression is now mediated by uh, the, the awareness of other other people mm. um, and that fosters a kind of I think self-reflection that uh, doesn't come naturally to most people I have a broader question about the college atmosphere it seems at least in the past few years or so that the college which should be the last bastion of free thought and uh, multiplicity of ideas has been uh, let's say dwindling down to various forms of uh, censorship and, and boycotting and, and, and things of that nature. Do you think, what do you think of that? Can you reflect on that? I, that's definitely the case. I've had experiences myself of, uh, not in creative writing workshops, I, I taught in both programs, the PhD program and the MFA program. And, um, you know, I've I would say in the last 10 years, I drew some fire for teaching things like Kathy Acker or mm. Marquis de Sade or um, even Conrad's Heart of Darkness. What was the uh, explanation for this uh, adverse reaction to those works? Well, the, you know, the obvious uh, criticism, I mean, the familiar criticism of Conrad is that it's, it's a colonialist enterprise, or it's in collaboration with colonialist enterprises, that it's racist, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. I think that is so remote from what Conrad actually wrote that it's, not, it's almost not worth talking about or debating. Um, mm -hmm. With Kathy Acker, oddly enough, I was accused by um, a woman of teaching a text that denigrated women. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, I'm not, uh, because, because it included scenes of rape. And a lot of people perceive, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but Kathy Acker is sort of anti-literary. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think she, well, the word literary, of course, has, has caused all kinds of trouble. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't much cotton to it. Um, I think that, um, you know, I think work is, is work. And in English departments or, you know, for, lit, for readers um, of high literary works or, you know, lowbrow works, uh, it's what's at stake always is the possibility of, of thinking fresh thoughts and um, mm. And that's, I don't know that there are any other stakes, actually. I want to fast forward to today, or let's say closer to today, in your latest novel, which is titled Play a Novel. It focuses or plays on the word theater, but I think it applies to more than just that. And I think we can segue into a quote. So this comes from Play a Novel. And who are they? Each so-called member of the audience, if not someone to be recreated by the imaginative author or director whose imagination they, after all, have summoned themselves to the theater to judge. Is there a more compelling dramatic conflict we should concern ourselves with than that between actor and audience? Not really, you have to admit, but not so many of us are honest enough to do so. And there's an epigraph by Nicholas Mosley in this novel that's particularly pertinent as well. 
Could you read that for us? A great book he wrote called uh, Catastrophe Practice, and he says to act is to do and to pretend. What are we doing that is not pretending when we know that we are acting? Mm -hmm. And that was, for me, resonant. And there's plenty of opportunities, and I don't know if you call them opportunities, but moments in life where all we can do is act according to some specified schema, no? Right. That's true. Um, but I would say the price you pay for that, you know, is real experience. Hmm. Um, and, um, and so I mean, that's sort of, that's the grudge behind the book, I guess, hmm. one way to put it. So the advice from Alan Singer is to try and, and live your life not according to some kind of script, as it were. Right. Um, which means, of course, to suffer contradiction and to be willing to enjoy the opportunities of self-contradiction mm. uh, and to have the strength to resist the temptations of identity. What you are saying seems to be touching also on the notion of free will. Are you a proponent of free will, or do you consider that mumbo-jumbo? Um, mostly mumbo-jumbo. Uh, will, I believe in. Um, I guess I'm under the influence of Nietzsche there. Um, but um, free will's too idealistic in a way. Um, and, um, but will, persistence in time, that, that for me counts significantly. Will with a cost, not so free. Always. <laughs> yeah, always a cost, but yeah. I wanted to transition now to another one of my favorite writers besides you, Joseph McElroy. And you wrote to me in an email, you said, At the time I was directing the MFA program at Temple University, I invited Joe to be a visiting writer. Can you tell me about that particular time in history? Um, yeah, it was a very um, lucky and short-lived time in the MFA program because we were flush with money. And so we, we were able to have a visiting writer who would stay for a semester and teach a course and teach a workshop mm -hmm. and uh, he came and he taught a course on Proust and um, oh they had to give a public reading too mm -hmm. so there was it was a really I think rich offering to the students mm -hmm. and uh, they took full advantage of it he was you know he's a real polymath and so he was he became part of the intellectual life of the department at the time, which was at that time strong, um, and um, became a good friend. Did he read from PLUS? Was he working on that at the time? PLUS had been published already, mm. I think five years before. I, f I think he did read from PLUS, and he, was, he also read, I think, from Women and Men. Mm. Well, where are we in time? It's, when did he first arrive? at the university. Oh, you're asking me to rely on memory. <laughs> uh, must have been early 90s. Oh. So not that long ago, because I was thinking maybe further back than that. Proust. Yeah, he read, he had, <laughs> he read the whole thing in a semester. Wow. He, he read it or he taught it or? He had the, stu he taught it, oh, which okay. means he had the students okay. read it and, uh, he gave some uh, really memorable lectures. I remember uh, Wendy Walker, she was celebrating the release of My Man and other critic fictions. She encountered Joseph McElroy at the release party and she considered or thought he was a, a fairly shy individual. Oh, really? <laughs> I don't know what your impression is. Or That's not my impression, but... <laughs> maybe it was just the atmosphere of the party that was affecting him. Yeah. Um, he was never 
shy. He was always interested in people, mm. people's projects, shared his own projects very generously. Um, really couldn't ask for a more admirable type. So perhaps the, uh, the, the atmosphere at the university was more his speed than partying ended up. <laughs> oh, that could be. That could definitely be the case. But I've, you know, I've socialized with him outside of the university. He's always very outgoing. Mm -hmm. So to transition a little bit now to the grander themes of your work that I've noticed, violence and sex, which are the chief muses of the reptilian brain, which, <laughs> which, which uh, becomes even more active during the time of dreaming so that the uh, reptilian brain can have the illusion of still ruling our brain, but I guess for some people there is no illusion there. Uh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, how is it, uh, what's going on in that brain of yours, Alan? Well, I, you know, I see sex and violence, I mean, the, the protagonist again in, in, in play sees violence as, you know, one st staging of reality. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is un, um, I guess I'd say, undisguised. Um, and he's trying to sort of strip the, the disguises off his audience. He's trying to strip his own disguise, egoistic disguise, which of course he fails miserably to do. But mm. um, I, I do think that there's something to be said for the idea that in, in violence, and this is, you know, sort of commonplace knowledge in the realm of tragedy, um, <clears throat> that violence is, is a place where you can see things uncluttered by, so to speak, appearances mm -hmm. to, to the contrary, that, that is civilized, mannered, uh, decorous, whatever. Violence is a frame-breaking thing, just as sex is. Um, and I, from, from my money, they're pretty much, you know, ways of opening the horizon to, you know, to experience beyond one's own, one's self-delusions. And so I guess that's why I'm drawn to, to write that way. I think, you know, sex, violence, and also comedy, uh, all function in roughly um, rhyming ways um, because they are they're all frame breaking gestures and um, and they and they open the possibility that uh, you can see yourself as undisguised for my birthday movie I chose funny games and you've reminded me of that where the the two killers often break the fourth wall, and there's even a moment where uh, uh, the victim gets the upper hand, but the killer takes the remote and rewinds the movie. Right. <laughs> uh, is that is that in tune with with your aesthetic? Yeah, although I th I actually think Haneke's a little too um, a little too dark for me mm -hmm. even. Uh, I, I think, I think he's oddly he has the effect, oddly enough, of being melodramatic because he's so extremely pessimistic. Mm. You mentioned comedy. Do do you put that in your work? Because I have to admit, I I can't say I've quite picked up on much comedy over the uh, other two <laughs> obsessions. <laughs> Well, this may be my my self delusion. <laughs> I think of the books as pretty funny, mm. um, or at least the 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 degree to which a lot of the characters are always uh, performing uh, as if they were hiding all of their secrets mm. when in fact they're very self revelatory mm. in ways they'd be ashamed of. Well, you're not alone in that uh, delusion because <laughs> Joe says that women and men, he considers it a, a, a fairly funny novel. Having read it, I can, I discern moments, but they seem to be very much submerged 
in the rest of the book's yeah. uh, proclivities. With Joe's work, I would, I would agree with you probably, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but I guess I'm not one to judge since I don't... Mm. I mean, <clears throat> with play, mm. I did get many, many, many comments that, the, that the, they people found the book to be very funny. Mm. Did they mention specific uh, moments? Yeah, they often mentioned um, actually the, uh, the spider surgery and... Uh, Mm. I don't know about that one. <laughs> uh, well, I admit I'm very finicky with humor, so maybe the problem is with this particular reader. Well, I wouldn't say you, you get belly laughs from it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it tickles maybe a darker, funny bone. Yeah. Well, speaking of films and violence, I'm also thinking of Tarantino's films. He gets a lot of flack for having and depicting violence. Right. Do you have um, any affinity with Tarantino's films, or no? With some of them, yeah. I mean... Um, Which ones? Well, I suppose um, the obvious one would be um, one with Travolta. What am I thinking of? Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction, right. Pulp Fiction, and uh, I didn't like Django very much. Mm. Um, I just thought it was sort of creaky. Mm. Um and I think he repeats himself too much. Perhaps that's why he's limiting his films, I think. How many? Or he, or he's retired multiple times, though. So. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Um, when I think of, you know, writers who are interested in violence, I think of people like uh, Cormac McCarthy, oh. um, whose work, I think, is terrific and dark. And I, I think, <laughs> well, this is my perversity, and I think also funny. Mm -hmm. Blood Meridian, did you find that one funny? Um, no. So <laughs> I found that was hair-raising. Mm. Uh, Which ones in particular? Uh, Outer Dark, these early ones, mm. Child of God. Do you know those? No, I'm, I still have to get to those. I think his, the early books are, are probably the best work. I, I, after All the Pretty Horses, it becomes less interesting to me until mm. you get maybe to uh, No Country for Old Men, which mm -hmm. is really a movie. And then he did, a, he did a, a screenplay called The Counselor, which is very violent, uh, and I think really good. What would you say is, is the best treatment of violence in any medium of art that you've come across? Oh, well, that's a hard one. Because you could, you know, something like Guernica, um, but that's not vis that's not visceral in the way that the last uh, the the Comanche the Comanche raid in Blood Meridian is, mm -hmm. or the can the scene of cannibalism at the end of Outer Dark, mm -hmm. where there's you know what what happens gives no scope for remorsefulness. They're sort of radical moves, I think, mm -hmm. and and uncompromising, and you either take it or leave it. There's one phrase, one, one combination of two words in Blood Meridian that stood out to me, and that was describing the invasion of, uh, of the Native Americans and how they're all dressed up. Yeah, that's, uh, that's actually the scene I'm, I'm, I'm okay, thinking of. Okay. They're, they're, it's a mixture of Native Americans and Mexican okay. AWOL soldiers and... Uh, yeah, that there's a page there, uh, of descri of you know, detailed description uh, that is just you know, there's no other word for it but ruthless. Well, the other uh, the two words I had in mind were uh, death hilarious is how he described their well, I, yeah. their charge, which seems to hit right on the nose with what we're speaking about. Those two modes that seem paradoxical. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's comedy and tragedy. I don't, eh, I don't know. Yeah. Um, well, we can move on to my next question, which is also about film. I'm wondering which novel, if you could pick any of your novels, would you adapt into a film? I don't know that I would. I, I mean, I, I like film, but I... 
I'm not a big believer in, in adaptation. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Um, I think because the adapter always feels a kind of, I mean, too much um, fealty to the original, even if the adapter doesn't really adapt mm -hmm. faithfully. I, I think the obligation there to translate from prose to, to images is, um, for me, it's too wide a chasm to, to bridge. Um, you lose, I mean, which is not to say that I don't like adaptations. Yes. I thought Jane Campion's adaptation of uh, <clears throat> Portrait of a Lady was a terrific film, but it wasn't an adaptation. It, it wasn't really Jane's. Mm. Um, and if that was her impetus, that is the fact that she wanted to make an adaptation of Jane's, I don't care that she was successful in X terms or Y terms. I think it was a, you know, she made a great film. Mm. Do you think it, uh, these adaptions could be more successful if, if they only use, as you said, the novel as an impetus and nothing more? Yeah, I, I have no problem with, with that. Um, although, I, you know, I should, I should uh, admit that the, the Coen Brothers adaptation of No Country for Old Men is pretty, pretty faithful. Apparently they were terrified of McCarthy. Mm -hmm. Wasn't that um, originally a screenplay? It was, he wrote it originally as a screenplay, mm -hmm. but then they were contracted to write their own screenplay, oh. which was not his. So to, uh, to uh, kick the hornet's nest one more time, if we categorize it in terms of impetus, which novel of yours would you want to be the impetus of a film? I... Oh. Well, the one that seems easiest is The Inquisitor's Tongue. Why do you say it's the easiest, or seems easiest? Because it's a costume drama, or it could mm -hmm. be a costume drama. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, histor it's a kind of historical... I don't think... I mean, it's a kind of... It would, it would be uh, recognized as a his historical fiction. Who would direct? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the Cone Brothers would be a good, <laughs> good team for that, I think. I'd like to see that. Maybe we can pitch that to them. <laughs> so I think they're busy. <laughs> yeah. I was actually going to ask about the historical nature of the Inquisitor's Tongue. Uh, this is your only novel, to my knowledge, that is set in the past, no? Yes, and I was reluctant to, to get involved in the past because I didn't want to, I, I, I didn't want, I usually don't do any research for my, my fiction and I didn't want to be, I didn't want to feel obli obligated mm. to the period, but um, I wanted, I wanted a character who was a converso, mm -hmm. uh, who was two people and, uh, and I, Spanish, the violence of the Spanish Inquisition, even though it's, according to more recent historians, uh, wildly exaggerated. Uh, it just, it came together for me very quickly. Um, and, it, you know, I, I, I didn't even think of <laughs> that it was a historical fiction. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I wasn't mindful of the fact that this was taking place in the past in, until I got into it. Mm -hmm. What was the initial shiver of inspiration? Was it the, the converso or no? Yeah, it's the converse, the converso, and the desire, you know, to be someone. I mean, here, here again is the performance of an identity that's not your own. Yeah. Um, but I, I started with. I mean, when I begin to write, I usually do not begin with a, you know, a concept uh, or a theme. I just begin with a, a scene, and the f mm -hmm. that first scene came to mind. Mm -hmm. Uh, the drawing and quartering in public, mm. and uh, I just stuck with it. I'd been looking at, I had been looking at Goya. Who is featured on the cover. One yeah. Of his, <laughs> the guy's little dunce cap there. Well, that's not the Goya. The Goya's oh. on the frontispiece. The, the cover was actually designed by, um, by the FC2 des uh, oh. designer. 
Well, they uh, definitely must have gotten. Uh... She, yeah, <laughs> I asked her to sort of <laughs> use the the goya that's on the inside as a springboard, and I think she, I think she did a great job. Well, she fooled me. <laughs> so that period of time certainly seems like it would go well with your obsessions, so no wonder you wrote a novel about it. Yeah. I'm wondering what kind of research you did in particular. Uh, I, I read one book about the latest scholarship on the, uh, on the Inquisition, and, and that was pretty much it. I did check myself after the novel was finished to make sure I hadn't made any Enorm enormous blunders. Um, the wine tasting was something that was already um, sort of baked in to the thing and didn't require any research. So why only one book? That that just gave you enough assurance to continue, or was it because uh, you have a, an, an aversion to doing research? It's not an aversion to doing research. I just don't like the inhibitions that come with mm. it. Um, or they can come with it. A lot of people, you know, need to do research. A lot of a lot of writers, you know, thrive on research. I just, I just don't like the uh, encroachments of. Um, <laughs> I hesitate, hesitate to say I don't like the encroachments of of factual reality. Mm. I was uh, going to ask you about that, <laughs> or at least the factual reality that isn't the factual reality in the book. Essentially, the a novelist is making things up, but there's always the question of how true do we stay to quote-unquote reality. And that question also comes up quite a bit when writers are depicting quote-unquote the other. Is that something you think about at all? Well, probably because the term the other is so loaded now with mm. a kind of righteousness. Mm. I wouldn't use it, but yes... The other, in the, in the sort of very practical sense of seeing yourself on the threshold of someone else's experience, that is valuable to me. Uh, and uh, I mean, that's exactly what I think is, as I said before, what I think is valuable about the creative writing workshop is finding yourself on the threshold of somebody else's mind. Mm -hmm. I think, right, I mean, writers need detachment from themselves and the protocols of most workshops are sort of guarantee that detachment. When writing about someone who's outside of your own mind, there seems to be a sort of walking on eggshells type of thing, at least today in our, in our modern world where people are easily offended and, and are looking almost uh, as a full-time job, to be offended. So do you think, in that sense, uh, there's an obligation to do more research, more research, until we're completely uh, inhibited and in a straitjacket? Well, I think that's, you know, where we're headed in, life, in lots of ways. It's important you know, for writers to resist that. I try to resist it, um, try not to be a reporter of a reporter of my time and place, mm. because that's usually a, a, a diluted perspective. Mm. And now I would like to transition to the concept of doubt as a writer. When I originally emailed you about your first novel, which is extremely hard to find, The Ox Breath, you of course expressed reservations about it, like pretty much any writer. Uh, concerning their debut novel. But you've also mentioned things such as The Inquisitor's Tongue is, is one that uh, one of the few that you say that you're still happy with. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. Can you talk about doubt and, and how you experience it and how you deal with it as a writer? Well, I, I guess I, um, I, I deal with it in the way I deal with bodily aches and pains. I think it's inescapable and and that's a good thing. Mm. Um, it's, it fuels a certain kind of skepticism. 
I wouldn't say necessarily nihilism, mm -hmm. but skepticism, a healthy skepticism. Of, <laughs> I should say, when I, uh, this morning I was thinking about um, this interview and I was looking over some of the, uh, the books that I haven't looked at in a very long time. Mm -hmm. And I was actually pretty happy with what, what I read. That's a good thing. Is, it is. It's un, completely uncharacteristic. I mean... And tomorrow will be different. But. Oh, yeah. So did you... When was the last time you have cracked open your first novel, The Ox Brett? Oh, probably when you mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> and was it, uh, was it a horrific moment when you cracked it open? Or... Uh, it wasn't horrific, but it was uncomfortable. Mm. What specifically made you uncomfortable? Was it just that the prose isn't up to what you're capable of now? Yeah, the prose was really clotted, I mm. thought. And, uh, and the, um, the, the typos <laughs> oh, yeah. didn't enhance the effect. Mm. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't want to over-dramatize it. It's, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm glad I wrote it, obviously. I'm glad it was published. I'll, I'll tell our listeners now, there's a review of The Ox Breath on the site, kaleidoscope.com, and I can guarantee you that this is a better debut novel than you'll find in most cases. You're too kind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not kindness, it's just the truth, at least my truth. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask about doubt in terms of a microscopic level. Do you doubt yourself from this from the level of the sentence to the sentence, or maybe even the word to the word, or is it more overarching than that? No, it, I think it's more, uh, more um, in the particulars, um, sentence construction, um, word choice. And how do you I, handle that? I, I, well, I write very slowly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I tend to revise a lot as you know, as I'm, as I'm, uh, you know, in the moment of composition, and um, and so it's it's a very slow snail's pace. Mm -hmm. um, although uh, the pace is picking up. I was going to mention that because your novel, play a novel, recently came out, and then you told me that you're working on something titled The Seahorse. Right. Why is it picking up? I don't know. I have no. I really have no, no idea. May, uh, maybe it has something to do with my, you know, the fact that I'm not teaching anymore, mm -hmm. and my time is more elastic. That always helps for sure. Yeah. Maybe we can home in on the seahorse. Was the seahorse, no pun intended, is a is a pregnant title, a pregnant metaphor yeah. <laughs> was that the shiver of inspiration for what you're working on now um that part of it the fact that the, the male seahorse uh gives birth mm. uh carries carries the eggs um but that's not where it's it that's not where it started it started with uh, a man drowning himself mm -hmm. out of a sense of guilt the main character is a character who's uh He's a kind of sin eater who thinks that he, that since it doesn't make sense for him, for the injust the injustices of, of human mortality are so manifest and uh, widespread, um, someone that needs to be responsible, and he almost takes it upon himself uh, to be responsible for pain and suffering, uh, and he. He's a, um, <clears throat> people will think that I'm inspired by COVID, but this started before COVID. Uh, he's a virologist mm. uh, who uh, makes a mistake and releases a vaccine that, that's, um, that's toxic. It seems COVID is taking over everything down from our day-to-day -day thoughts to art. And uh, any mention of a virus or a vaccine or quarantine is now pregnant. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I don't know how, else, how I will escape <laughs> the, the shadow of, 
of COVID and people's interpretation of this book as somehow a pandemic book. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not any more than, I mean, as you know, one of the characters in the play is called Siri, mm -hmm. and uh, people assumed I was alluding to Apple mm -hmm. products, but um, it's actually uh, the name of a friend's wife. As a devil's advocate, I would say, why don't you just change the name? Because the other, she's, she's paired with another woman whose name is Sigrid. Mm. And in Swedish, the uh, Siri is a shortened version mm. of, of Sigrid. And I needed that, mm. I needed that wordplay and that relationship. Perhaps there is an afterword that needs writing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a disclaimer. I was thinking of a staple question to ask you, my, my first and honored guest, and everyone else uh, who will come afterward. And what I've hit upon was, what is a book that has had the most profound effect on you, whether in your personal life, your writing life, or all of the above? I guess I would have to revert to, uh, to Nightwood. Uh -huh. um, in part because it, it licensed me in a way. Uh, it, it's so unlike most other books. Uh, it, it seems to uh, give permission to do anything. Uh, it's also, the prose is also obviously deeply influenced by, um, the prose and the chromatics of it are influenced by Jacobean tragedy, which is, mm -hmm. as you know, violent and sexy. Uh, so, um, so I guess it's no surprise that that would be the book I, w I would name. I've been flirting with reading it for quite some time, and what was putting me off was um, the the fact that apparently it was edited or censored, as it were, by T. S. Eliot, the the more. Um, common edition of the book. Are you aware of this at all? No, I'm not. I knew that Eddie, Elliot wrote the preface for the New Directions edition, mm -hmm. which is the one, the first one I read. And apparently the Dulkey Archive is the true edition uh, that is unedited, uncensored. No kidding. Uh, however, I recently did a little more digging into it, and I discovered that uh, overall, there's really no true difference between uh, those editions. So, it, it mostly, uh, it's for the interest of scholars or, or super purists. Yeah. Uh, so I'll just get the one that's more available and finally read it. Yeah, Eliot's um, his introduction to it is pretty good. Mm -hmm. I know. I knew. I knew that she was. Uh, you know, she took his recommendations pretty seriously. I don't think she took many people's recommendations seriously. I do enjoy her illustrations, and I, I read, um, I can't remember the exact title, but Hideous Women or something. Oh, the Almanac of, um, yeah, something women. Uh, there's also a book of short stories called, oh, yes. called Spillway. It's quite good. And her book, Writer, is, is quite good. R-Y-D-E-R. -E okay, I, I haven't sampled that, but I did sample uh, the story collection that was brought out by Sun and Moon Press. Right. Although I was getting sort of Sylvia Plath vibes in the sense that these are more commercialistic. You can tell that this is coming from a more idiosyncratic writer, but it's definitely more commercialistic. Yeah, she was making a living and... Uh... And she was also, um, I, th I think she was in some peripheral way involved with The New Yorker. Mm. But that, I think that book is original in ways that um, can't be attributed to Joyce, uh, can't be attributed to, you know, the, those high modernist gurus. It sounds wonderful, and I, I do hear whispers about it on, on social media. And it sounds like a perfect uh, thing to cover for what I do at the Kaleidoscope. Do you have any tips as far as approaching a novel uh, this unique? 
yeah, just keep reading. <laughs> <laughs> Go from sentence to sentence, Go, yeah. even if you don't understand. It, it yeah, it it carries you from sentence to sentence. There, are, it's very, um, in in some ways, it's very theatrical, um, and uh, so there are long sort of aria monologues by uh, some of the characters, um, and it, it'll it'll sweep you off your feet. It doesn't. Uh, it's also a very, I think, um, it's sort of a difficult book because it's it's really about, in part, it's a it's, well, it's a love it's a love story. It's about love. Uh, people will say it, you know, it's about gender, but I, I think that burdens it too much. It's uh, the characters are pretty despairing. It's not what I would call bubbly in any way, mm. but, um, but she was, uh, you know. She was a very strange person. I tried. I actually went to try to visit her once. Mm, uh, a pilgrimage. When I was young, yeah. She famously lived in um, Greenwich Village. And uh, she didn't want to talk to anybody, especially mm. me. <laughs> How did you approach approaching her? Well, I just went to her, you know, to the gate in Patchen Place, which was where she had lived, I think, since the 40s. And uh, she was very cranky and told me to basically fuck off. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh my. Well, the, and this is why I I fantasize about doing the same thing to Don DeLillo, but maybe I should not. <laughs> well, you, I mean, what do you have to lose? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I'm thinking of going to New York, depending on how COVID is looking. Uh, wish me the best of luck. I, I wish you the best of luck. <laughs> if you're in Philadelphia, look me up. Certainly, certainly. You, you mentioned to me that you're working on two projects. We talked about the seahorse. What is the second project? Well, I've, my whole time, my whole professional time, my career is I've worked simultaneously on a novel, novel and a critical book. And I'm writing a book now called uh, Attending to the Literary. That's my attempt to explain how works of art sh shape forms of attention and why that's important to uh, lived experience. When do you think we'll be able to pick up a copy of The Seahorse and that critical book? Well, the critical book, I'm on the last chapter of, the, of a draft. The Seahorse, I've only got about 150 pages. Hmm. And after you finish a, a, the manuscript for a novel, how much editing goes on until you're, you're f officially done with it? It's, re it's really variable. It depends in part on what editors have to say. Uh, but uh, I reworked play significantly hmm. um, with my editor and it was, it was a terrific experience he was very he's very good and he's uh, he's a writer also and um we actually spent a month just emailing back and forth line by line commentary yeah that seems to be a dying art is the the type of line editing at least with uh the more commercialistic publishers yeah, I mean that's why I was I was thrilled that they were interested in this book because uh, mm -hmm. that's what they do. They're committed. And the seahorse will be coming from Grand Iota as well. If they'll take it, yeah. Wonderful. Well, I wish you the best of luck there. Well, thanks very much. But maybe I... you don't need it. Well, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Everyone needs it, <laughs> I think. Mm -hmm. True. So now uh, I would like to hear you read an excerpt from the Inquisitor's Tongue. Whenever you're ready, please begin. The crowd parted to reveal the specific nature of the challenge awaiting my nascently legendary powers of taste. It trembled at the long table's precipitous edge, a goblet of crystalline water. Behind it, several carafes of the same colorless liquid stood in line. Beside it stood another goblet, barely wetted with what could not have been more than a thimbleful of Rioja if one could judge by its ruby glimmer. A dozen similarly tinted goblets were ranked in single file behind it. 
That minuscule dose of the grape in each might have been the red quavering eye of a whole rabbit staring up at me from the depths of the impeccably blown glass. I immediately guessed the gambit in which I was already ensnared. I was the rabbit myself, facing the probing nose of the dog whose toothsome snout was as wet as the bobble of wine inveigling my capture. But the rules of the game remained to be set, set forth before I was permitted to presume upon what I knew very well would be my fate. Or perhaps the rules were only belabored so that the fairly buzzing audience would come to attention and let the silence ring that much more portentously than the cardinal's finger skimming the rim of an empty goblet that he now raised above his head. He needed an appeal to sight, since the dulcimer tone spun upon his moving finger had merely become entangled in the hubbub. This is how it would be. His voice was ponderous with authority. The words were squeezed from the tightness of his smile like sugary juice from the ruptured skin of the grape itself. He instructed us all. Osvaldo Alonso de Zamora must imbibe the ethereal bubble of wine and immediately douse its savor with a mouthful of water. Swallow. Then pronounce the names, the names of the grapes so evanescently infused in the disembodied dram. Each act must be performed with the strictest economy. No swishing of the glass, of the liquid in the glass, nothing of its aroma to be indulged in the nose, not a drop to be let loiter upon the palate. It must be washed away almost before the tasting buds of the tongue can flex their grip. Only the ghost of its vaporous fermentation can guide his judgment. And what was being wagered against my talents? There would certainly be something in the balance for a feat weighted with such improbable expectation. I knew the wantonness of the cardinal's tastes as painfully as I strove to realize my own. This is what I wager. Mendoza's lips sealed the answer to my question as oozingly as the molten pitch seals the barrel staves of the oaken cask. My man Osvaldo's taste against Monsignor Boca's man's daughter. No doubt as savory a taste as any man's tongue could desire. I understood immediately. Nothing of the Monsignor himself to be hazarded, but what was valued by his own servant above everything that poor valet could even imagine his master might already possess. And I, myself, was nothing more than a counter a chit, a blank line, upon which monetary value had already been affixed as easily as the insignia of an official indictment by the auto de fe. I espied her. Now we were we. She was the demure daughter whose purple habit elicited an exclamatory hush when she was pushed into view to display the innocent blood of her novitiate self. I was my own foolishly attired selflessness, thereby deprived of even a dignity to be violated. We were empty vessels waiting to be filled with the delectation of our betters, and yet we were not much more to them than the transparency of the spotless goblets that were arrayed on the adjacent shelf and that would soon be brimming in celebration of someone's certain defeat. If it should be mine, I knew what salvation I would thereby accomplish. But I am explaining how it was my taste, not myself, that stood to be tested. My tongue bristled as involuntarily as hair sprouting from the root of my tongue with readiness for the challenge. By the rules of the wager, the most difficult hurdle would be capturing the holy ghost of a flavor before its smoke-light ascension from the quenching draft of clear liquid. The transparency of the water would be rendered more bountiful 
by the powerful gulp that was mandated to wash away the blood of the grape's demise. Cardinal Mendoza's heretical conceit, the tight smile still wringing its salubrious juices from the moment, was nonetheless an admonitory finger wagging in my direction. That much I understood. But my taste remained an in inscrutable force of this circumstance. I anticipated the eventual outcome with no less wonder than the gathering spectators. I grasped the stem of the first goblet because I was so ordered to commence. But the hiving buds of my tongue were animated by a volition of their own. They gathered in a military phalanx, giving an iron point to the spear of my licking incubus. Myself shoved aside by the selfish protuberance of my tasting prowess would be the first rent in the veil of the little sister's purity, whose eyes seemed to me sewn shut, though she was now the most prominently positioned witness to the spectacle. Out of the stinging corner of one eye, I saw her slippers peeping out from under the heaving purple hem. They were as round as the, at the toes as two beating droplets of blood, or they were wrung from the plush fabric of her novice's raiment like the juice of the pitted grape, are we not meant to believe that blood and wine are the same thing? She believed, no doubt, but belief has no taste. I am just as certain, for the guilty knowledge of her quavering presence only two steps to my right, we might have been bride and groom at the altar, was thoroughly erased from my consciousness by the lip of the goblet slippery with the excitement of the moment, delivering up to my nose the ever so ethereal annunciation of the rubescent bubble trembling in its readiness to crown my tongue. By the rules of the wager, my other hand was already in possession of the water goblet, quite deliberately full, enough to require the swiftest of graces if I was not to spill, and by that mishap, let the firmly beaded droplet of concentration just bobbling among the discriminating follicles of my tasting organ dribble away into the indistinguishable reaches of my throat and esophagus. But the truth was, I could no more spill than think. I could do nothing that was not the will of that vaunted taste, possessed as I was of its impetuous fervor. The gulp of tepid water designed to confuse wetness with wetness, only slaked an uncanny thirst for what it washed away. A grain of sugar, a blade-like sliver of tannic sharpness, the merest mealiness of fruit, as alive as the tendril of vine upon which it bobs, were all still savory enough. Clenched in the acrid flex of that muscle, which is rooted in the capacity for regurgitation, these sensations of taste now produced the mysterious grape in the word that was bursting with its name ability. Tempranillo, I permitted the blush of my tongue to be exhibited as the nuptial bedsheet as proof of consummation. Something sharp as a pointed stick seemed to poke Monsignor Boca's eyes from within. And then, Sangiovese, at least 10%, Zanuga, less than 10. There was an audible tremor of silks amidst the lavishly garbed guests. Water into wine, my friends, and so I told you. The boy is a miracle. Cardinal Mendoza gave a bow, a flourish of his richly sleeved arm that seemed to scoop some invisible bounty from thin air. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alan, for reading that and for taking the time to be on the show. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate it, and I'm looking forward to reading what you come up with next, my friend. The feeling is mutual. There you have it. I hope you enjoyed listening to this, the first interview on the Kaleidoscope podcast, but by no means the last. I want to thank Alan for his time and friendship and for popping the show's interview cherry. Aside from the two reviews previously mentioned, 
You can also find a text interview with Alan Singer that was published on the site at the beginning of 2021. If you want to see more content like this, then the best way to show support is by becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash the kaleidoscope. Aside from early access to interviews and reviews, there are other awesome benefits, such as monthly book picks, editorial services, and the opportunity to ask your favorite authors a question. Thanks so much for your support, and stay tuned for even more content, including a reading of a story by William H. Gass. Together, we can make the unheard heard.